New today, the just released exclusive WRL News poll shows Kamala Harris with a slight lead over Donald Trump in North Carolina. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Gerald Owens. And I'm Deborah Morgan. Our exclusive WRL News poll shows Vice President Harris up three points over the former president. Capitol Bureau Chief Laura Leslie is here now with how the race has changed just over the last few months. Laura. Deborah, just six months ago, our WRL News poll showed Trump with a five point lead over Biden. Now, with Harris replacing Biden at the top of the ticket, the lead has switched too. The Survey USA poll shows us where Harris is making up that ground. Our latest WRL News poll shows Harris leading Trump in North Carolina 49 to 46, with 5% undecided. Less than 1% said they'll vote for a third party candidate. Compare that to March. Former President Donald Trump was leading incumbent Democratic President Joe Biden by five points, 50 to 45, with 5% undecided. That is a swing of eight points in the past six months. But Survey USA pollster Ken Alper says that's not too surprising for a swing state like this one. I'm sure we're going to hear some people saying, that, you know, there's no way that Harris is up three points in North Carolina. And again, it's a snapshot in time. Uh, you know, she may not be three points up. After Tuesday, she may be up six, she might be down three. Alper says some of Harris's gain has come from voters who didn't want to vote for either Trump or Biden and are relieved to have a different option. Harris has also made big gains among women, especially suburban women, a group that has swung elections here in the past. In our poll, suburban men favored Trump over Harris by two points, 47 to 45. But suburban women favored Harris by 14 points, 54 to 40 for Trump. Alper says the poll also shows younger voters are also breaking for Harris. I think that the Kamala Harris campaign has really done something kind of amazing on social media, kind of, you know, going from zero to, to 60 in no time at all, and have really energized, you know, that that relatively small but important group of voters. Among voters 18 to 24, 72 percent back Harris compared to 24 percent supporting Trump. In the next age bracket, voters 25 to 34, Trump leads by 7 percent, 49 to 42. Whoever they're supporting, voters say they're happier with their options now. In March, a majority of voters in our WRIL News poll said they wished they had other options. Six months later, voters are satisfied with their choices by a nearly two to one margin. Now, our WRAL News poll surveyed 676 likely voters across the state last week. It was conducted by Survey USA and has a credibility interval of 4.9%. Well, we're getting down to it now. Just 56 days from Election Day, and all week we're going to be revealing results from our exclusive WRAL News poll. Today, we are centering on the presidential race. Survey USA conducted this poll, and it finds that Vice President Kamala Harris is leading former President Donald Trump by three points here in North Carolina on the eve of the first debate between the two candidates. Ken Alper is here. He uh, he runs Survey USA. Joining us now to talk about really what goes into conducting these polls. Good evening, Ken. We appreciate you being with us. Absolutely. Let's talk about the process because people, of course, can make, they understand the results, but it's really important, I think, to uh, explain the methodology, the, the how you got these numbers. Absolutely. So for state polls like this, we conduct the research online using members of internet research panels, folks who've agreed in advance to take surveys. So, you know, 20 years ago, we were able to do this entirely on the telephone and enough people were still using lab lines and still answering the phone uh, and participating. And as you know, that's not the case anymore. So we still use the phone when we need to for smaller projects usually. Uh, but for state level work, that's it's a lot more expensive to use the phone and it's no more accurate, no less accurate. So these folks are basically waiting to take surveys and uh, they get notified, they get sent into our poll questions, and then we apply some census data to those results to make sure that they end up being properly representative of the state. What we don't do is we don't try to apply our own feelings about who's going to vote and not vote. You know, there've been elections in the past where some polls have said, yeah, you know, we're not gonna include anyone who didn't vote in at least two out of the last three elections, that sort of thing. Or they've made assumptions that, you know, because the percentage of young voters was X in the previous election or because Y percent of the voters in the last election were African-American, that the next election is gonna look the same or it's gonna look different. We don't make those assumptions. We make sure 
sure that our data reflects what the census says the overall population of the state is, and then we let people tell us whether or not they're voters. We always see the margin of error. When we see a scientific poll, there has to be that, that give or take one way or another. Talk a little bit about the, the fail-safes, the things do, that can ensure that these results are as accurate as possible when the people at home are, are trying to interpret what they might mean. Sure. So, you know, in, in the industry, we tend to talk not so much about margin of error, but we use a term called total survey error because we're not just looking at the most technical things. We're also looking at the most basic things, which for us, a lot of it comes down to what we've done since the beginning when we first started doing this in the 1992 election. And that's writing really clear questions that aren't biased in any direction, that don't slant the results either intentionally, which would be awful, or almost as bad accidentally slanting the results one way or the other. We want to make sure that our polling is as accurate as it can be because our, our whole job is to get the election right. If we get it right, we do well as a company. If we get it wrong, we don't get to work a lot more elections. You know, another part of that is working carefully with our vendors to make sure the people who are taking part in the online surveys are real and that they're reliable respondents, that they're not what we call professional survey takers, people who take, you know, too many polls all the time and aren't answering them seriously. Some of that is coming from the vendor. A lot of it, though, is our own internal checks where we're looking at everything from how long a given respondent takes to complete the survey, to making sure they're not giving us inconsistent answers, to asking them open-ended questions so that we're making them type something in their own words which really gives us some insight to make sure that we're, you know, looking at real people here and that we're getting data that we can feel confident and that you and your viewers can feel confident in. Polls are a very popular thing, uh, getting a pulse of what is happening, not just for the candidates and for the various parties, but for the voters at home. That said, because of their popularity, we see so many polls out there nowadays, and the scientific polls end up getting mixed in with the non-scientific polls in the eyes of some of the viewers at home. But I do want to specify the work that you're doing, and historically, you've seen a lot of accuracy with the polling compared to what the final result ends up being. That's right. We have a great track record. We're A rated or A plus rated, depending on who's doing the rating, and we are solidly up there. We've also done more public opinion polls on elections than I think anyone else in the database because we've been doing this, like I said, since the 1992 election. All right, Ken, thank you so much. We appreciate you being with us, uh, explaining these very important results to our viewers at home. Uh, thanks for your time tonight. Absolutely. Now, state lawmakers have said they have the overwhelming support of voters to expand the state's school voucher program. However, new data shows that may not be the case. The new WREL News poll shows about one in seven likely voters thinks North Carolina should spend more on vouchers than it's already spending. WREL's Capitol Bureau Chief Laura Leslie is here now with what voters told us. Laura. Deborah, our exclusive WREL News poll surveyed 676 likely voters across the state last week. Knowing that state lawmakers were considering expanding the state school voucher program, we asked voters for their opinion about it. North Carolina currently spends about $300 million a year on vouchers for private schools. We asked voters whether they thought the state should be spending more or less than that. 16% said the state should spend more. 21% said the current amount is about right. 19% said the state should spend less. And 22% said the state shouldn't be spending any money at all on vouchers. 21% weren't sure. As you can see, opinions on any given spending level were mixed, but it is safe to say the majority of voters do not think the state should be spending more money on vouchers. Only 16% said we should spend more than $300 million. 62% said they think the state shouldn't spend more than that. Pollster Ken Alper says lawmakers may think more voters want to expand the program because that's who they're hearing from. So there's an excellent chance that, you know, both things are true. The people the legislators are hearing from are probably strongly in favor of it, and the population as a whole probably is a lot less sure. Alpert said support for expanding vouchers is highest among voters aged 35 to 49 because they're the most likely to be able to benefit from it. He said it had the least support among senior citizens. More than half of voters 65 and older said the state should be spending less on vouchers or nothing at all. Uh, the statewide poll was conducted for us last week by SurveyUSA. The credibility interval is 4.9%.